Amen, amen. All right, church, you may be seated and welcome to One Life Fellowship today. Um, man, if, you, uh, if you're a guest, we're really glad that you're here, of course. And uh, as John mentioned, I hope that you'll take a moment sometime today to fill out one of our Connect cards so that we can know how to be praying for you and to help you take your next steps, whatever those might be in your spiritual journey. Um, and if you are with us on a regular basis, same, right? Let us know. Man, we're, we're all in progress, right? None of us has arrived. And so uh, that's just a way our Connect card, either, either on paper or digitally, for us to communicate with one another and to help each other. Um, so we're going to be in the book of Galatians today. Galatians chapter 6, and Lord willing, we're going to go from verse 1 down to verse 10. We're continuing in our series that we call Set Free to Live Free. Set Free to Live Free. Um, we have been in this series now for several weeks, reaching now the last chapter of this letter that Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia. By the way, if you missed last week's service, man, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to that or watch that. God showed up and uh, kind of ruined us and then rebuilt us as we, we went to war, didn't we? Went to war with the flesh, uh, directed by the Word of God and uh, in response to the Spirit of God moving in our lives. I know that many of you uh, found grace in a new way, freedom and, and victory in Jesus, and so we're thankful that we have that, amen? And um, I'm sure that some of you, even this week, have discovered, as we talked about, that the spiritual battles that we face and fight have to be fought daily, right? It's, this isn't a, a one and done, come to the altar, pray, leave it, and in the sense of salvation, man, it is, right? I mean, man, praise the Lord for eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord, but there are battles to be fought day in and day out, and God has equipped us with His Spirit and His Word to do those things, and of course, a body of believers to do that with. And so, um, man, away we go, right? And we're going to kind of pick up really right where Paul left off in chapter 5. He starts now into um, chapter 6. I want to say um, one of the things that really made me happy to be here and to be a part of this body was last week when so many responded as the Lord was moving to come and and, and leave things here, right, at the foot of the cross, so to speak, and putting our bodies down as a living sacrifice, as Scripture said. What I really appreciated, in addition to that, was those of you who, man, you have found victory in several ways in your life that just came and stood over and stood behind and prayed over and with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, man, I just uh, thank you. Uh, I believe that God is at work. Amen. And, and He is changing us, and He wants to continue to use us to take, uh, take his, his message of salvation and peace and joy and hope and all the things that we saw, the fruit of the Spirit, to the world around us. So uh, thank you for that. Today, uh, for those of you who like to take notes, our message is titled, Caring and Sharing. Caring and Sharing. And both of these terms are really, uh, can be used very broadly in the Christian life. Uh, Paul kind of narrows them down to some particular aspects of how we function in the church toward one another. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today, verses 1 to 10. Um, and we're going to start by caring in the church and, and talk about, uh, well, let's just read it, verses 1 to 5, and then we'll, we'll make a few comments on the way here as we go. Um, the Word of God says this in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. So Paul comes off the heels of talking about how we need to be walking in the Spirit and therefore not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Remember from last week. And, and now he, he moves forward. And the reason, one of the reasons it's so important that we be walking in the flesh is, or in the Spirit instead of in the flesh is because there are times when we will be overtaken in a, in a fault, in a trespass, in a sin. 
And, and we need spiritual people, those who are following the Spirit, to be there to help each other as we battle through this lifetime. Does that make sense? Because we're, we're in this, right? We're in it together. I, I hope we all understand that. Caring in the church. Now, there are a lot of things that can be said here. We'll, we'll say a few things, but I want to highlight three things. Um, the first one I think is really obvious uh, from the passage and I think also by experience. And the first one is this. Uh, again, talking about caring in the church, first we want to understand. People fail. People stumble. People fall. Right? And, and I know this sounds really obvious, but, but we don't want to miss that point. He said, Paul is saying here, if any man is overtaken in any trespass. The word trespass means sin or offense. It's something that needs to be forgiven, either by God or by man or by, or by both. Now, just, just to be clear, is there anyone else in the room besides me that would say, oh yeah, I've been there before. I've, I have been overtaken in a trespass at some point in my life, right? So that would be all of us. And, and so when he says here, if any man, or if, if, if a man be overtaken in any trespass, just know we're all kind of in that same bucket together. And, and that's going to happen to each and every one of us at some point in time. Now he says here, um, overtaken, this particular word kind of uh, speaks to something that happens suddenly. Um, sometimes it can be very unexpected. And, and as I was thinking about it this week, I thought, you know, I know I've experienced in my own life how sin can kind of come upon us or overtake us really quickly at times, right? And, and sometimes, and maybe some of you even found this out this week, sometimes you can feel like you've gotten victory over something, but, but then the next thing you know, you step right back into it. Anybody ever been there? And boy, how frustrating is that, right? You're like, oh man, I mean, like, like it really is frustrating. And when I think about frustration over our own failures and stumbles and, and sin and so on, I, I think again of Paul, remember in, in Romans chapter 7, he says, man, I'm, I am right there with you. He'd be the first one that says, I haven't arrived and I am very frustrated because there is a battle happening in me. And, and sometimes he says, I, I even step back in the things that I've I, I thought that I had victory over. Well, like I mentioned, last week we went to war. And there was victory and grace and freedom that was found. But don't ever forget, friend, believer, don't ever forget that like, we're never out of danger completely, right? I, I mean, in fact, maybe the most danger that you can be in as a Christian is to think I'm out of danger when it comes to spiritual battle. I mean, you, you're probably most susceptible at, at that moment. Now, I'm not saying that to scare you per se, right? But I do want to warn you, and I, I think we all need to have like our guard up, right, all the time. Um, I think of Ephesians chapter 6. Paul says, put on the whole what? Armor of God so that you can withstand. Who do you need to withstand? The enemy. Who's the enemy? Man, certainly the devil, the world, the flesh, all of those things that we talk about all the time. Be careful and be on guard. Now, do you need to be afraid? Well, not really, right? There's, there is a fear of the Lord that's really good, where we hate evil and, and we want to run away from that and run towards Him in righteousness. But do you remember 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, where the scripture says that God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear. But of what? Of power and of love and of a sound mind. Man, that's what He's called you to live in. Power and love and a sound mind. So, so don't be afraid but yet have your guard up and be ready all the time, lest you be overtaken. Suddenly and unexpectedly you find yourself tripping on the same things that you thought you had victory over. Let me give you a verse here to think about, maybe memorize if you haven't already. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. It's a great, great verse that sort of warns us and at the same time shows us that in Christ we can have victory all the time. No temptation has overtaken you. Same word, right? Overtaken you, except such as is common to man. But God is, what to say? He's faithful. God is faithful. It means he shows up every time. And he is not going to allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. So when I read that, man, it, like, it's really exciting news. But then it's also frustrating. Are you tracking with me? Why is it frustrating? Because the scripture says, no temptation that comes in front of me is too great for me. Not, not in the Lord. But then why do I keep stepping into it? Why do I keep stumbling? Why do I keep falling? Well, because of me, right? Because of me. There is no temptation 
that, that's too big or beyond what I'm able to handle in Christ. He says, but with the temptation, God will also make a way of escape so that you're able to bear it. And we're going to talk about bearing burdens here in just a moment. So this is a fantastic verse. And I would encourage you to memorize this thing. The thing that it does is it takes away our excuses, doesn't it? It says, oh, you, you, in Jesus, you got this. And there's always going to be a way out. Listen, I hope that you know this. Um, sometimes I think we make excuses and we feel like we're victims to whatever this thing is that kind of has us by the throat at times. But I want you to know, I want you to believe that God's always making a way out. Right? Don't, don't believe that you can't have victory in Jesus. Because that would be a lie of the enemy. Because God always makes a way of escape. He's faithful every single time. So here's what we have to do. We have to train ourselves to look for it, right? When the temptation comes, we need to immediately be thinking, how do I get out of this? And usually, at least for me, there's, there's this, anybody ever heard in the Bible of a still, small voice? Right? When the Spirit of God lives in you, and that temptation's right in front of you, there's like this split second where it, it, you hear this voice going, hey, don't go there. Right? Are, are, anybody with me on that? Hey, don't go there. Don't look at that. Don't say that. Uh Uh-uh. Right? That is your moment. That is your way of escape. That's the door out. Right then, you need to run. Did you know that sometimes in spiritual battle, the best way for you to battle is to hightail it and run away? That is spiritual battle, right? Paul told Timothy, flee youthful lusts. There are times when you need to look, and then you just need to run and get out of there. Anybody read the story of Joseph? Remember what happened to Joseph? Now, uh, Joseph had some challenges, and there was a temptation put right in front of him, and he hightailed it out of there. Right? Now, later he got in a little bit of trouble, not of his own accord. It was persecution, it was the enemy, but you know what? God was with him all along the way. And he'll do the same for you. He will do the same for you. What a great, what a great promise of God. He is faithful, he'll always provide a way out. You've got to train yourself to look for it, and then you, and then you might just need to run. There are times when you're going to run, and there are times when, in the armor of God, you are just going to stand. And what are you going to do when you're standing there? You're going to pull out a sword. It's called the sword of the what? Anybody know? Sword of the Spirit. Do do you know anybody who just stood their ground in the face of temptation, and they pulled out the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God? Can you think of anybody who did that in the Bible? Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, Jesus Christ himself. When the enemy came to him to tempt him three times... In a very vulnerable moment in his life. And he pulled out the word of God. He said, hey, let me just tell you how it is. <laughs> and you know what happens when you resist the devil? The promise of scripture is, he will flee from you. Do, do you see how victory is yours in Jesus? Isn't that a great? I mean, the word of God is so good. And he, and he lets us know victory is ours in the Lord. Nevertheless, people fail. People stumble. People fall people sin. Sometimes I'm surprised that we're so surprised by that. Isn't that, isn't that, it's kind of weird, right? I mean, just even in the news, periodically it just seems like in the news and social media and all this kind of stuff, you hear about people failing and falling. And, and supposedly these are really spiritual people, you know, they're, they're pastors, they're missionaries, they're, you know, whoever it is, and they stumble and fall. And I'm, I'm constantly surprised that we're surprised at that. Now listen, it should be sad. It should break our hearts. We don't want to go there, right? Um, at the same time, we need to remember, man, this is, this is part of the battle. And there will be casualties. And what we're going to see here in a moment is, is the reason that we need to be walking in the Spirit is because at any given moment, you or I, we're going to stumble and we're going to fall. And what you need are brothers and sisters around you that can come along. And because they're led by the Spirit, man, they can pick you up and help you move forward as good soldiers in Jesus Christ. Do you feel like you need those people around you? Listen, you absolutely do. I do. I need you around me because I am not immune either. I was thinking through the Bible this week, just thinking about men and women in the Bible and their susceptibility to fail and to fall. I thought about Moses. Did Moses ever fall? Moses had an anger problem. Do you know that? I mean, like he got angry and, 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 and committed a failure, a sin, contrary to the Lord, that kept him out of the promised land. That's how serious of an issue this was. David struggled, wrestled, failed with sexual immorality. 
Think about Peter in the New Testament. Peter, Peter was one who was not only impetuous, right? I mean, like he just did stuff without thinking, but he also was afraid. How afraid was Peter? He was so afraid that he denied that he even knew the Lord three different times. After Jesus had invested three years of his life into him, Peter had a fear problem and it caused him to fall. Um, a, a disciple named Mark traveled with Paul and Barnabas and on probably Mark's first missions trip, like, like he, he had commitment issues. And in the middle of the trip, he said, I'm out, I got other things to do, peace, and left. So much so that later on Barnabas wanted to go back out as a missionary and wanted to grab Paul. And Paul said, no, nope, we're not bringing that guy with us. Man, he doesn't have the stuff. He doesn't have what it takes. And it caused friction between Paul and Barnabas so much so that they, they separated from one another and went different directions. And Barnabas took Mark and, and, and Paul took Silas. Mark had commitment issues. Um, all of the disciples, when you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, had issues with pride. I mean, can you imagine hanging out with Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh. He's doing miracles, he's doing everything, and, and all glory, honor, and praise to the one standing right in front of you. And as they're following him, they're whispering about which of them was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Uh, the guy in front of you. <laughs> and, and none of you, right? Pride issues all the time. Um, he even got their moms involved. Hey, mom, why don't you go talk? And maybe you can convince him that you know, one of us can be on the right hand, one of us can be on the left. Because, you know, um, flesh, we, we saw last week, and we see often how Paul says, man, he struggled with his own flesh. So things that he wanted to do, he didn't do. The things he didn't want to do, he did. It frustrated him so much so he cried out, oh, miserable man that I am, wretched person. When am I going to be free from this body of sin and death? Um, Apollos in the New Testament had some doctrinal issues that, that others had to approach him on and, and kind of work him through. A couple ladies in the church of Philippi named Euodia and Syntyche, man, they were at odds with one another and Paul's writing a letter. Imagine this, imagine an email from One Life Fellowship goes out and it says, hey, um, church, uh, man, you guys are doing great in this way and man, what a great service we had last week. It wasn't worship, outstanding. And then so and so and so and so needs you to come alongside of them because they're, they're having a hard time getting along. And your name, by the way, was so and so. Right? Why? Well, that's what happens in the letter of Philippi. Hey, these guys, you need to come alongside these ladies. They're, they're struggling to get along with one. relational issues and so on. People stumble, people fall, people fail. Here's the good news in every one of these cases, God's grace abounded more than their sin. Amen? And it does in your life as well. Romans 5, chapter 20 uh, says, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. All right, we need to move on. I spent more time on that than I had planned to. But here, here's the encouragement or the, uh, the challenge to you. Guys, as, as followers of Jesus, we have to give other people around us the, the freedom to fail. The freedom to fall. Without coming in... As, as brothers and sisters and fellow soldiers and just running all over the top of them as we move forward in the battle. Are you tracking with me? Like, man, we got to be ready to pick up our fellow soldiers and help them move forward. That means uh, when we, and by the way, when we do that, when we give others the freedom to fail or fall, uh, am I saying, by the way, that we just go light on sin and we take it easy and we, we turn a blind eye to it? Does anybody hear me saying that? Okay, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that they'll stand before the Lord. Uh, we may need to have some hard conversations from time to time, but we need to give others the freedom to fail because when we fail, we're going to want them to do the same with us. We want to come alongside each other in love and with grace and truth so that we can go forward and battle together. That's what we're called to do. Speaking of what we're called to do, here's kind of the next thing I want to say about carrying in the church. Carrying in the church. First of all, understand people fail, people fall, people stumble but we're in the business of, of being soul restorers. I, I want you to see it again. Uh, look at chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. We're in the business of soul restoration. By the way, this is a command of Scripture. The word restore there is what we call grammatically an imperative. If you know Jesus, then he has called you to be one who will restore the souls of the people around you who have fallen. 
That's, that's part of your responsibility as a Christian, as someone who's a member of the body of Christ, to come along and help restore those around you. What does that mean to restore? It means to perfect. It means to complete. Um, there, there's a, it, the, this same Greek word, it gets used to talk about the disciples when they were uh, sat down after fishing and they were mending their nets. I mean, they're going to sit down and take some time and, and they were going to fix, restore, and complete those things so they could do the things God had called us to do. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, a verse that we'll read together here. Paul says to this church, For what thanks can we render to God for you all? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Part of our job is to come along and help each other grow in Christ, to be complete, to be mature, and to restore one another when we, when we fall. Now, I want to say a few things about this ministry of restoration. First of all, it's not for the weak. How do I know this? Because he says, you who are spiritual are the ones who are to restore. Right? Well, what does that mean to be spiritual? Well, remember, we're just coming out of chapter 5. What was chapter 5 about? Verse, verse 16, walk in the Spirit. Verse 18, be led by the Spirit. Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If you are walking in the Spirit, not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh, therefore the fruit of the Spirit is producing itself in your life. He says, man, you're the ones who need to come along and restore those who have fallen. So just know this. Know this. Um, this isn't going to be easy. It, it's probably not going to be convenient. And, and it's probably not going to be comfortable. He says um, in verse 2, Bear one another's burdens. All right? This is heavy stuff. This is hard stuff. God never said when you become a Christian, it gets easy. And it gets light. You know the way, the only way that a burden is light, you know how it is? Go back to the Gospels. Remember what Jesus said? He says, hey, take my yoke upon you because my burden is light. Man, when you walk with Jesus, guess what? He's carrying the load. <laughs> right? He's the one doing that for you. And, and so you, you walk with him. And now what he's saying is, hey, you need to come alongside and help those who have fallen as well. It's not for the weak. It's not for the carnal, as I mentioned, not, not for those who are walking in the flesh. And this is why it was so important last week where, where we got in and said, man, this is battle. And, and not only do we need to be walking in the Spirit for our sake, but your brothers and sisters in Christ need you to be strong in the Lord so that when they fall, you can come alongside and help them because they need you and you need them. It's not for the weak, it's not for the carnal, and it's not for the proud. He says, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Remember, gentleness, if you look up a few verses, it's part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's what the Spirit produces in you. In other places in Scripture, that same Greek word is translated as humility. right? In gentleness and humility. No, so in other words, we need to be really careful that we don't think too much of ourselves. We, we need to be careful that we're not comparing ourselves to others. Um, if you want to compare yourself to someone, compare yourself to God, right? And His standard, the Word. That will keep you humble, by the way, will it not? And, and it'll, it'll make sure that when you see a brother or sister who has fallen, man, you can come alongside knowing, I have not arrived yet either. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and I am who I am, and so I'm here to help you right now. And once we get you all healed up, I hope you're ready to help me when, when I'm overtaken in, in a fault. It's not for the proud, this ministry of restoration that we have been commanded to do. By the way, this is how we care for one another. Right? Now, caring for each other can mean a lot of things. But Paul right here is pretty narrow. He's saying, look, when someone has been overtaken in a fault, I need you guys to come along and help each other. Uh, to move forward. Uh, in our young adult group, we meet on Tuesday nights. Um, we've been studying through the book of Job together. And this week, as I was thinking about this, this humility and, and caring for one another, man, I just was thinking about Job's friends who came alongside Job. And man, they started off really good. You know, the best thing that they ever did for him was they came and they sat there and they didn't say anything for seven days. 
And that was the best thing that they did for him. Because then as soon as they opened their mouths, you know what? Boy, they thought too much of themselves. <laughs> and they gave him a lot of counsel. A lot of the counsel they gave him was actually true. It just didn't apply to him at all. <laughs> and, and they were just sure that they had diagnosed properly that he had some kind of sin in his life. And, and really, it was them who were blinded to themselves and what was going on in their own lives. One of the ways that we care for each other is that we recognize that, man, people are going to fall, people are going to fail, and we're going to be walking in the Spirit so that we can come along and do what God has asked us to do, and that is help to restore those who have fallen. Now let me give you one more piece here, and then we're going to move on. It's in verse 5, and, and um, so we're going to bear burdens, right? And it's going to be heavy at times, um, and, and, and at the same time, I'll say it this way. I think Paul brings a little bit of balance in here. Let's read verse 5 again. He says, for each one shall bear his own load. And I remember thinking about that this week. I thought, man, it seems like on one hand he's saying we have to bear each other's burdens. But then at the same time I'm supposed to bear my own load. Well, is that a contradiction or what is he saying? Well, no, there are, there are things that are going to burden us and overwhelm us and they're too heavy for us. Uh, maybe it's, it's a fall spiritually, and we are going to need other people to come along beside us. And I feel like at the same time Paul is saying, though, hey, but, but don't forget, you've got some stuff that you need to carry on your own as well. right? In fact, these words are different. The words burden and load are different in English. They're different in Greek. The burden's like this spiritual heaviness, almost overwhelming, uh, probably spiritually because... I have fallen in some way. The word load, when it's used outside of Scripture in some places, it, it would refer to kind of like a, a soldier's pack. Like, like, in other words, every soldier, man, they've got their gear, and, and because they're, they're moving forward in the Lord, they've got some stuff that they've got to carry on their own. And, and so I think the way I would say it is this. We all are soldiers in the army of Jesus Christ, and we all have a load to carry. And, and we shouldn't expect that others will carry the load that God has given me responsibility to carry. Does that make sense? Brings a little balance in here. We don't want to take advantage of others and just say, Oh, hey, I can't. You need to do for me. No, there are things that God has said, Hey, you are a soldier. I have equipped you. I need you to get up and let's go. So, so make sure that, man, if we fall, hopefully there's some there to pick us up. But don't look around and start yelling at people because they didn't pick you up either. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there are times when... Times when there isn't anyone else around. And, and I have to get up on my own. right? In the Old Testament, by the way, when I say on my own, in the strength and power of Jesus, right? And the Spirit and the Word. I remember in the Old Testament, uh, there was a time, for example, when David was running from Saul. But he had kind of like this whole following of people that, that was with him. And, and they had gone out and basically been defeated in battle. Really, behind them they were defeated. They weren't, but as they were out ready to do battle for the Lord, some folks had come in and kind of wiped out their, their, their town and burned it. They took their wives and took their children and, and basically kidnapped them all. And then David's guys all turned on him and said, well, this, this must be your fault somehow. And, and one of the phrases that I love there says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. Have you ever had to do that? Encourage yourself in the Lord? Now, he could have gotten bitter. He could have blamed them. Maybe he could have you know, rallied a few and set them up in front of the firing squad and kind of fired all of them. Or, no, but there are times when we have to carry our own load. And, and, and so uh, there's a little bit of balance here. Well, maybe the way I'd want to wrap this part up is say, look, uh, we all have a part to play. In the body of Christ, we all have something to do. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16. We studied through Ephesians um, not too long ago. He says, From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You know what that means? That means that God has called you. If he's called you here, he's called you here for a reason. It means you have something to offer. It means God has equipped you and he has gifted you. And there are people around you that need you. And he's expecting you to do your share. He's expecting you to plug in. For you to get connected. For you to use the gifts he's given you to minister to the people around you. That's how we're going to grow. That's how we're going to be edified in love. That's how the world is going to look and go, man, there's something there that's different. These guys are caring for each other. 
and everyone's doing a part. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean they've arrived. Man, they stumble, they fall, they fail. But when they do, they surround each other, they help each other, and everyone's got something to contribute. Man, guys, that is the church. And the church flourishes as each person does his or her part as we care for each other. That's who we have to be. I hope you connect this back to It's why it's so important that we're walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh. That's how we're going to be strong in the Lord to help each other and to do the things that God has called us to do. Now, before I move on and talk about sharing, Paul's talking about caring for one another in the church, particularly bearing each other's burdens in the Lord, understanding we've each got a part to play in that. Do you hear something here? And, and here's what it is. That this requires, this kind of ministry of soul restoration, it requires that we be in relationship with each other. In other words, church isn't just showing up to the event on Sunday morning and, and then just waiting for the next event the next Sunday morning. Church means that we got to be in each other's lives. We're woven together. When you go back to Ephesians chapter 4, you read about how we are members of the same body. He uses terms like joints and ligaments. We are connected to one another. I think it's in Corinthians. He's talking about the body. and He said, man, we're like eyes and hands and feet. And, and God puts all those pieces together, indicating that we need one another. And we are better together. And so what I'm doing now is just encouraging you to make sure you get into fellowship with other believers in the body of Christ. Do so intentionally. Do you, even this morning, as I was just thinking about this point, I, I, I was so happy. Yesterday morning, we had over 40 men that came together for a men's breakfast. And man, it was great. A couple men, men just shared their story, their, what God has done in their lives. And plus there was bacon. And so, man, it was, it was amazing. It was so good. At the same time, I know there were like 15 women across the street having coffee at, at Starbucks. Um, and at, then later on that afternoon, I know a bunch of our young adults got together and had kind of a game night together, fellowshipping with one another. I mean, I mean probably like 25 or 30 percent of the people who are gathered here were connecting with each other. And I'm sure there were some that I don't even know about. Right. Connecting with that's what we're supposed to do. Right. That's what we say, like doing life together. We're helping one another. One of our guys, uh, because of the storm that happened, um, afterwards said, hey, I, I said, what are, you, what are you doing this afternoon? Man, we got one of our guys, um, he's got a house over in Crystal River, and I'm planning to go over there and just spend some hours shoveling mud and, and just getting stuff out of there. Just interacting with each other, being a part of each other's lives. It requires that we be in relationship. Some of the things we do here, um, we, we develop some life groups because we want you to get connected to other people. And I would encourage you to do that if you're not a part of a group somewhere. Uh, in, in this church at 915 every Sunday, we have other groups, adult groups. Our young people are meeting together. Our kids are meeting together so that we can be in each other's lives. When you find a place to serve, you start ministering with the people around you. The next thing you know, you're in battle together. And you're there for someone, and someone is there for you. It's how we care for one another. Okay? Let, let's move on, because Paul doesn't stop there. Now he goes on and starts talking about sharing in the church, verses 6 through 10. Let's go ahead and read these verses. He says, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So not only do we care for one another, but we share with one another. In verse 6, Paul specifically speaking about financial giving in and to and through the church. Um, in this particular verse, to help those who are working in that ministry full time. Um, as I was thinking about this, and I don't know, maybe for those of you who are newer to the church, um, you know, it's, it's a little weird to stand up as a pastor and say, hey yeah, so I'm one of those that teach and you make sure you, that you're sharing with me, right? But can I just assure you, it isn't about me. Right? This is the Word of God, it's about the ministry of God, and it's about us, because it's so much broader than this, helping one another and sharing with one another. 
Uh, particularly in verse 6, he talks about sharing with pastors and teachers. Of course, it, it gets a lot broader than that. Let me mention a couple of verses to you on this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. This was Paul uh, sharing, as he was writing this letter, really just thankful to the church for what they had shared with him. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. So he was thankful that uh, as a missionary, this church was looking out for him. Of course, they prayed for him, but they also literally, financially, and physically supported him so he could do the things that God had called him to do. Now, obviously, giving in and through the church is is broader than just the pastors. Uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 27 says, It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. And you could read the, the larger context there. He basically was saying, Hey, look, you guys, Gentile believers, you have the gospel because of the Jews. God brought Jesus to the Jews, he brought the gospel to the Jews, and the Jews went out, and they brought the gospel to you. And he said, now they're in trouble, and so you guys ought to be willing, since you have received spiritual things from them, you ought to be willing to give back to them materially to help them as they move forward. So we share with one another, both spiritually and, I'll say financially, or materially. Uh, I want to talk, and, and again, if you're brand new to our church, uh, you may think, oh man, this is one of those churches that talks about this all the time. Um, we talk about it when we come to it in Scripture, right? We don't really talk about it much more than that. But um, there are a lot of practical reasons why we encourage uh, followers of Jesus to be, to be giving and to give generously in and through the institution that God has ordained that we do, do that through His church. Um, <clears throat> The, the lights are on in this room today. And, and you can see, you know why? Because there are people around you that give to the work of the ministry so that we can turn the lights on. There's, there, the AC is on right now. AC is not essential to Christianity. Amen? That was a weak amen, wasn't it? Huh? <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't know, let me pray about that. Um, <clears throat> Actually, you don't have to pray about it. See, if you give, just it'll come on every time you show up here. Like the AC is going to work, right? Do you know why that happens? Because people around you are faithful to give to the work of the Lord, right? Um, and those are just, I know those are really, like, really practical. Like the work of the Lord is the air conditioning the work of the Lord? Well, you tell me. I mean, if you invite your neighbor to come to church and they come with you and there are no lights on, and the AC is not working here because we couldn't pay the bill. How are you going to feel about that? <laughs> not, not great, right? Um, it's all connected to the work of the Lord. Uh, because people give, um, we have a kids ministry and we're able to purchase supplies and, and to help them know and grow in the Lord. Uh, we have all kinds of just physical things, the audio and visual and all of those things. We are able to support missionaries. And we support a, a staff of people because the body shares materially with one another. Now, why do we do that? Is it all about just physical and material giving? No, it's all for the glory of God, right? I mean, isn't that what Scripture says? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the what? To the glory of God. So that we can reach Ocala and beyond. So that we can make more disciples of Jesus. And it all just requires that we're faithful to the Lord in giving. Paul says here, verse 7, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And, and one of the things about Paul, man, he was not ashamed to kind of just press, right? Press a little bit. And, and as he's talking about this giving or sharing, he says, look, just keep in mind, you'll reap what you sow. In other words, he's encouraging them to give generously. For the work of the Lord, knowing that you will reap accordingly. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6 says this, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And, and he was speaking, if you go back and read 1 Corinthians 9 and also 2 Corinthians 9, it's in the context of financial giving to the work of the Lord. So Paul was not afraid 
to challenge people to be extremely generous so that we can take care of each other, we can take care of physical needs, both individually, but also uh, as, a, as a body for the things that we believe that help us make disciples to reach Ocala and beyond. Uh, last year, our church, you guys, man, you gave significantly so that we could um, purchase some security cameras to put all over the building. I want you to know that project is just about done. Just a few more of those to be done. Because of the world that we live in, we felt like, man, the best way, one of the things that we need to do to shepherd our body well is to make sure we're as protected as we can be reasonably. And so you guys gave for that. I want you to know that project is almost done. We feel really good about that. Uh, not only, God forbid, if something crazy happens, then, then we have the ability to, to help each other, to help the authorities, and so on, to uh, take appropriate steps after that. Um, it's not just about physical things, as I said. Paul, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 17, I mentioned this context already. He was thanking the church for giving to him, to helping with his needs, and he tells them why. Philippians chapter 4, verse 17. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Fruit. What's he talking about? He's talking about spiritual fruit. When you invest in the kingdom, those things are accounted to you spiritually as fruit is born through the body of Christ. Man, I can, I'm so thankful right now that we are seeing people saved and baptized and discipled. We're seeing people connect to one another. We're seeing people become soul restorers. We're seeing people invite their neighbors, invite their friends, talking to their coworkers, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all of these things fit together. It's why we do all of those things. And I would love for us to do more. And the more that we give, the more that we can give away. Right now in our church, um, a couple years ago, we decided that everything comes in, we're going we're gonna to give 10% of that away. We're just going to take 10% of everything that comes in, we'll give it to our missionaries, we'll give it to those uh, other people for benevolent purposes, we'll give it away in the sense of uh, providing things for our community to introduce them to the gospel, to introduce them to a place of people that love and follow Jesus um, what if that number wasn't 10%? What if it's 25%? What if it was 50% one day? Um, I would love for us at some point to be able to buy a, a home or two to help families in our community that are distressed. That maybe for a season, man, they just need a place to land for a week or a month. I would love to be able to do that. We're not there right now, but as, as we are generous and as God blesses and as we grow and as we continue to give and each one does his or her part, then we're able to do more and more for the cause of Christ. Paul says here to not give would be to mock God. He says in verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Now, of course, this isn't just about giving. It's not just about finances. It has to do with, as he goes on to say, there's the spirit and the flesh. Right? When we sow to the spirit, we reap the things of the spirit. When we sow to the flesh, we reap the things of the flesh. As I mentioned, giving isn't just a financial matter, it's primarily a spiritual matter. And just like caring requires everyone to do their part, so it is with giving. In this passage, he mentions over and over again, us and we and we. And, and so what does this look like? Um, what does this look like for you individually? Uh, I'll say this, in our church, we don't, um, we, you know, we don't, I've said this before, we don't have like, like money police, you know, tithe police. But in, in the Old Testament, I mean, 10% was kind of a basic standard. And, and so we encourage people in discipleship that, man, make that a goal. And then as God blesses you, even give above and beyond that. Knowing that, what Paul says here in verse 9, he says, Don't grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. It takes time. Um, the, the return on investment, whether it's financial or spiritual, and all of those things kind of play together, um, it takes time. I've been praying for revival in our church for years, like over a decade now. And by the grace of God, I think, I'm, I think we're maybe like just now beginning to see that happen. I don't know if you see that. I don't know if you feel that. I don't know if you're experiencing that. But man, when I look around, I say, man, God is... I, 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 even this morning, like I'm meeting new people here all the time. And, and we see God adding to the church such as should be saved. 
And so I'm thankful to be a part in a, in a, in a place where God is at work. Uh, again, it's not only financial, it's also spiritual. He kind of mentions here in verse 10, it, it really broadly. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Not just the pastors, not just the staff, not even just to those in the body of Christ, but to all. And then he says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. It's everyone. Each one doing their part for the cause of Christ. So that we can see God do more and more. So we can make more and more disciples of Jesus. How do we wrap this up today? This way. Caring and sharing is not just a duty or a responsibility, though it is that. But it's who we are and, and we do it because of that. We do, we care and we share because of who we are. Not, not just because we're trying to check a box and say, oh, we're doing the right thing. Not, not just so that we feel like we're safe with the Lord. No, it, it's who we are. God has shown his care and his love for us. How did he do that? Man, he shared the gospel with us when Jesus Christ came and died for us on a cross so that we could be forgiven of our sin. Because of what Christ did for us, now we get to share in an eternal inheritance that God has reserved for us in heaven. And in the meantime, he's given us the opportunity to care and share with and for the people who are around us. Once your soul has been restored to his through faith in Jesus, what he's saying here is now you become a soul restorer as well. You become one who comes alongside others to bear their burdens with them. You become one who is a contributor to the cause of Christ for the glory of God in all things. So, as a church, as a follower of Jesus, as a member of the body of Christ, are you ready? Are you ready to bear one another's burdens? Are you pressing into relationships with the people around you? Looking for opportunities to come alongside and carry the load. Because sometimes we're going to be overtaken and we're going to fall. And God is saying, I need you to be spiritual. I need you to follow the Lord. I need you to follow the Spirit because He's got a ministry for us to do. And are you growing in the way that you give and share with this body and the people around you? All of that makes sense when you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior and He begins to grow and mature us in all the ways that He has described for us today and in and, and all the things that we're talking about in His Word. And we'll continue to do that. Even next week, by the God, grace of God, we'll wrap up Galatians chapter 6. So let's go to the Lord in prayer today as we wrap up. Um, as we do, uh, bow our, bowing our heads and closing our eyes, I want to ask you, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? Do you, do you see and understand that Jesus died on a cross to forgive you of your sins? Have you repented? In other words, turned in your heart and mind away from your sin and turned to Jesus to accept the gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sins. If you've never given your life to Him and received Him as Lord and Savior as we pray today, then I want to encourage you. That would be the first step that you should take spiritually in relation to Him. And then, as you accept Christ, we're looking for opportunities to grow in the Lord, to help one another, to challenge each other, to encourage each other, to be a soul restorer. The Word of God says, By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We have been set free to live free in love for the glory of God. Father in heaven, we thank you for your amazing grace. There's no one like you. We thank you for the way that you've loved us by sending Jesus, the good news has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ, offering us forgiveness, salvation, and eternity. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody listening today, either in the room or online, that has never trusted Christ, that right now will be the moment of salvation, the moment where they receive your gift. The wages of sin is death, but by the grace of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we thank you for the amazing, indescribable blessing of being in relationship with you of our salvation. And Lord, I pray that you continue to grow us as a church, as individuals, 
that we would be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, ready to take the gospel to the nations and ready to bear the burdens of those around us, our fellow soldiers. Lord, we pray that you would do all of these things for your glory, for your honor, and for your praise. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.